find ourselves in at times, uh, they seem to challenge us for everything we're worth in our faith. Amen? And we forget that it was probably a storm that brought you to Jesus in the first place. Amen? Amen? I mean, because we're kind of hard-headed or, or uh, well, very worldly-minded before we know Jesus, and as a result of that, God has to get our attention, and he gets it through many ways, and it's usually a storm. Amen? There's things that happen in our life that bring us to a place that we realize that we need God. And he does all sorts of different things to bring us to an understanding of reality that we need him. Boy, and that's one of the things that brings me to this place. You know, we know that it's impossible to please God without faith. Amen? We know that. And we know that he creates for us the circumstances that allow our lives to be in alignment with him relationally. He desires to have a relationship with us. He wants to care for us. And uh, he wants to accomplish things in and through our lives. And in order that to happen, then we're going to have to be able to hang on through the storms. Amen? You can't bail out in the midst of the storm, right? And, and many of us, many of us do. Many of us take alternate routes or try to, amen? Boy, we know Jonah sure did, didn't he? He didn't want to go to Nineveh. He ended up getting tossed off a ship and a whale had to pick him up and deliver him to Nineveh. Hello. Amen? Yeah. So, you know, thinking a lot about the way that our, the cycle of our human nature is, we seem to get into these ruts and we find ourselves in another storm of life, right? Sometimes we can see a storm on the horizon and we try to divert off of it, away from it, before it gets to us. And in reality... God is giving us the opportunity to see him work in and through our lives if we'll trust him. Amen? So i got a passage of scripture here tonight I'm going to take a look at. It's found in Acts chapter 27. Acts chapter 27. When it was decided that we, could, that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some of the other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius, who belonged to the Imperial Regiment. We boarded a ship from Adrumanium and sailed to the ports along the coast of the province of Asia. And we put out to sea Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was with us. The next day, we landed at Sidon and Julius, in the kindness to Paul, allowed him to go to his friends so they might provide for his needs. From there, we put out to sea again and passed to Lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. When we had sailed across the open sea off the coast of Cilicia and Pomphylia, we landed at Myra in Lycia. There, a centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy and put us aboard. We made slow headway for many days and, headed, and had difficulty arriving off Cnidus. When the winds did not allow us to hold our course, we sailed to the Lee of Crete, opposite of Saman. We moved along the coast with difficulty and came to a place called Fair Havens, near the town of Lycia. Much time had been lost, and sailing had already become dangerous, because by now it was after the Day of Atonement. So Paul warned them, Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to the ship and cargo and to our own lives. 
But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter, in the, the majority decided that they would sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a harbor in Crete facing both southwest and northwest. When the gentle south wind began to blow, they saw their opportunity. So they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, the wind of a hurricane force called the Northeastern swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind. So they gave way to it and they were driven along. As we passed to the lee of the small island called Claudia, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. So the men hoisted it aboard. They, then they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together because they were afraid they would run aground on the sandbars of Citrus. They lowered the sea anchor and they let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued to rage, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. And after they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would not have, you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God of whom I belong, who I serve, stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And the God, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. On the 14th night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea. When about midnight, the sailors sensed they were approaching land, and they took sounds to find that the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found it was 90 feet deep. Fearing that they would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors for the, from the stern and prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair on your head. After he said this, he took some bread and he gave thanks to God in front of all of them. And then he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some food, food themselves. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach. 
where they decided to run the ship aground, if they could, cutting loose the anchors. They let them in the sea and, at the same time, untied the ropes and let, and that held the rudder. Then they hoisted the foresail and the winds, and it made for the beach. But the ship struck the sandbar and ran aground. The bow struck fast and wouldn't move, would, not, would not move, and the stern was broken into pieces by the pounding of the surf. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping, but the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and keep them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first to get to land, and the rest were to get their were to get there on a plank or other pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land safely. Some storms you can't swim in. Some storms are treacherous. Amen? That's a crazy journey, wasn't it? When I think about the picture of Paul, he is a confident character. He was somebody who knew, he knew who he served, amen? All right, so if you take these other guys, I just love the story in and of itself. If you go back to the beginning where we started, Acts 27, 1 through 11, we see some things there, uh, going on there. It was a time of year that was dangerous. And Paul had given this warning that said that uh, it was disastrous. Disastrous. And boy, I'll tell you what, it's an interesting thing when you think in terms of, of listening to whosoever's, right? When I think in terms of listening to the pilot and the owner of a ship. Boy, you know what that reminds me of? The Titanic. The Titanic. That was the ship that even God himself couldn't sink. You remember that one? Right? You know what's an interesting thing? That here we're in the 27th chapter of Acts, but back in the 16th chapter of Acts, Paul and his companions were kept from preaching and, uh, in the province of Asia by the Holy Spirit of God. They were held back. I think when a character like Paul begins to speak, and obviously his reputation uh, was known to some degree as in the favor that he found, as in they decided they weren't going to kill him, right? But an amazing thing happens when all hell breaks loose. You know, it's an amazing thing when you realize, when you hear, when you hear, Something like the Titanic was unsinkable, but yet it lays at the bottom of the ocean. When you hear the man of God that says that an angel stood before me and told me that all will be lost except your very lives, but no one's to exit that ship. Your very lives will be spared. Now they're out there being battered, and I can't imagine tying ropes on the underside of a ship trying to keep yourself from coming apart at the seams, if you will. But as it would be, a lot of times the man of God, when, they, when something gets said like, hey, listen, this trip is going to be disastrous. There's going to be massive loss. And even our very lives, only God, God gave grace and mercy on this journey, didn't he? Because they didn't lose any lives. And that's... God's intervention when the angel came and said, you know what? Everything's going to be a total loss except your very lives. So there you have it. A crazy journey. Verse 12, it says, since the harbor was unsuitable for winter, the majority decided, I love that, the majority decided, right, that we should sail on. The majority decided. Well, that's a dangerous thing, isn't it? The majority decided. I love that. I love that. 
That's like having a church business meeting and all the people you haven't seen since the cows come home come out of the woodwork. Amen? And they're the majority. You know what? Broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter therein. Amen? Narrow is the other one. And few find it. I think I'd be listening to the man of God. Amen? You're looking at the storms. You know what we've been talking about a lot? with our devotions in the morning, is the seasons of life. You know, we were in Ecclesiastes, of course, there's time for everything under the sun. Amen? We don't like seasons of life, do we? Especially if the one you're in is not very sunshiny. Amen? Especially if the things that you're dealing with are difficult. But make no mistake, seasons are required. They're required in our life, and God accomplishes great things in the midst of these crazy seasons, right? Boy, I think the storms of life, verse 13, a gentle southern wind began to blow and they saw their opportunity. Isn't that special? So they weighed anchor and they sailed along the shore of Crete. And before, and before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeastern swept down from the island, and there you have it. You know, <laughs> it's amazing because you, you know things sometimes. Sometimes the Spirit of God, even if you're here tonight and you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, then the Bible says when we are born again, we become alive in Christ, that the Spirit of God indwells us. We have the ability to discern spiritual things. Amen? And when we discern spiritual things, we have to submit to the authority of the Holy Spirit to benefit from that. Amen? Or we can say, go fish and do it our way. You might end up on a ship somewhere with some hurricane winds. Amen? When God has something else planned, but it's an amazing thing what he'll do in the wreckage. Amen? He'll do amazing things with the man of God. If you choose to allow your life to be in alignment with God, amen? The ship was caught, verse 15, the ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind, so they gave way to it and were driven along. And boy, when I list, just listen to that, I hate the sound of that. So they gave way to it, right? First thing that came to my mind in the process of the storms of life is when, you know, when the storms are battering us, right? And, and you're having abusive winds and all of hell's fury is pounding on your life. And I, in my Bible, guess what it says in Ephesians chapter 6? To stand firm when that day of evil comes. And after I've done everything to stand, then stand firm. Don't give way. We don't give way. We don't get driven along by some outside force. Amen? Well, I'll tell you, when I think of the livelihoods of, of fishermen, you know, the disciples, you know, you think about them following Jesus when they just left their nets and came and followed him. In, in the big picture that that really was, when you think in terms of our, our personal lives and what that would represent as far as, you know, your livelihood being left behind in order that you would uh, follow the Lord Jesus, right? You know, and that's a wonderful thing to be freed from the, the tug and the pull of the things like that. But when you, when you think in terms of what was going on on this vessel, on this vessel, we had a whole bunch of something else going on. They were getting pounded, right? They, had, they were for fear that the, they were going to run ashore. They put ropes underneath the vessel. Uh, they, they lowered their anchors. All these things were going on. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. You, you hear me? <laughs> if you can imagine... That going off the deck with their own hands. In other words, the only thing they're concerned about at that point is their very life. Anything that had any value 
suddenly was diminished to nothing over the board, off the deck, in hopes, I, I don't care what it weighs, get it off. They were freaking out, to say the least. They were absolutely in despair. Verse 20 said, When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and the storm continued to rage, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. Can you imagine the despair? Could you imagine looking at a vessel? And if, if you'd imagine the experience of those who've been on the open sea, if you can imagine what that would be, to be in the midst of this crazy storm and coming to the place that you feel as if there's no hope of being saved. That's a grim place to be, isn't it? All because somebody had ideas that thought that sailing was a good idea in October or whatever that was time of year where things were getting crazy and storms were kicking up. They'd lost it all. Verse 21 says, After they have gone along without fo food, Paul stood up before them. Men, you, sh you should have taken my advice and not sailed from Crete. Then you would have spared yourself the damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. He's not the guy that's saying, I told you so. That's not the attitude that's being, ex that's being experienced here by those who are receiving, nor the attitude Paul had in the way he was communicating. It was the confidence in the Lord. He was confident in the message he received would come to pass. Exactly come to pass. And then in the midst of this craziness, you would see some sort of verification as to who he was of who he is in relation to who God is. You know what I think of the, the picture of Paul and Silas and they're sitting in a jail cell, right? And in the middle of the night, they think praying and singing praises to God's a good idea. And so they start, you know, creating a ruckus, if you will, and, and praising God and the walls, the jails, uh, walls come crushing down. And everything that was happening in the picture, you see Paul looking and saying, this is an opportunity to display Jesus through my life to this guard. And we know, of course, the story is that the jailer and his household were saved. Here we have him on a ship. And he's got the right idea again. He's going to be a messenger of the message of God. You guys, everything that you have here is going to be crushed. This angel told me this, and I believe it's going to happen, so therefore it is. Therefore it is. Verse 27, on the 14th night, we are still being driven across the Adriatic Sea when about midnight the sailors sensed they were approaching land and they took sounding and found that the water was 120 feet deep. Short time later, they did it again. They found that it was 90 feet deep. So they were afraid of the rocks that were going to tear up this vessel. And so some of them decided they're going to try to escape. They're going to try to jump off. And their ideas are foiled. They're not able to do it. Because Paul tells them exactly what would happen. Paul urged them all to eat. He tells them to take courage. They're going to need it. You're going to need it. When you think in terms of wondering if you're on this water and this, this, this sea is, is beating the ship to death and you've lost all hope and now there's this glimmer of hope, but if you could imagine the fatigue that would be upon these individuals from the experience itself. And mind you, when hope comes into the picture, again, they're still on very, very dangerous waters. They're not on dry ground when they're hearing this. And there they find themselves in amongst this dangerous mess. Dangerous winds. Boy, 
in the, the issues that go on in our lives, the parallels that are here are unbelievable. They're unbelievable. We have the opportunity so many times to take heed to this instruction of the Holy Spirit of God, to take the Word of God and allow Him to direct our steps and be on the receiving end of all the benefits that go with that, and also be able to accomplish the very purposes that He sets forth for us to accomplish if we'll just listen. Well, just listen. Down in verse 39, it said, When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they let them into the sea, and off they go. They're off they go. The ship, of course, streaks, it hits this sandbar. The bow struck fast, would not move, and the stern was broken into pieces, pounding in the surf. They had to cut loose those anchors. I'm going to tell you what, there's a lot of stuff in our life we probably need to cut loose. <laughs> Amen? Well, I'm just imagining this image of everything they did had to be super high tension. Panic, because the very next thing you do could take your life. It could take your life. You imagine the ones on board who could not swim. The guys that could swim, you could see a sandy beach, we're going to be okay. Amen? You can't swim, you're jacked up. Right? You can't swim, hey listen, I'm not happy until I'm back on the ground. An old friend of mine one time, long time ago, we went out in the similar weather conditions. It was October. We went on a charter fishing boat. And, uh, and we were instructed that that wasn't a good idea. I was on Lake Michigan. And they, he told us, this, ain't a, this is not a good idea. We have six-foot swales out there. He goes, I, I fished waters like that, but I don't know if you guys are going to like that. We were dumber than shoehorns and thought that was a good idea to go anyway. And off we go, and he's just got this, this vessel, this, shipping, this fish, sh fishing vessel wide open and we're just hitting the tops of these six foot waves we don't feel anything it's kind of like boom boom man it's ain't too bad boom 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 we're just moving along and it's a big big vessel and suddenly he pulls a throttle back it's just like this and now those six foot waves were tossing us around like ping pong balls my buddy had said hey i'm feeling a little sick right now when will this sickness uh, go away? He says, about an hour after you're on land. I didn't go real well. But I can imagine the emotion of this story. I can't stand. You know what? I, out there in that, when, you know, I don't know if you get seasick or motion sickness, anybody that understands what I'm talking about, in the fear when, when the very vessel you're in is coming apart, a lot of fear, there's a lot of emotion, a lot of things are going on in the minds of all these, these people, these soldiers trying to, uh, uh, you know, uh, plan their way of what to do. They're going to just kill these people, kill them off so they can't escape, and they're prevented from doing so. And the story goes on. So they tell them, jump into the water. If you can swim, head to shore. If you can't, if you can't, grab on to some of the wreckage, the planks and the pieces of the ship, so that they can reach land safely. And I think about that, because I've talked about the Titanic in different times that I've preached uh, pertaining to the, that imagery that's there. Remember and I've talked about, you know, they should have been pulling off the very different things that were made of wood on the Titanic instead of having you know, this band play all the way as they're, they're going under the water. It's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. They'd be pulling doors off and tying them together with bed sheets or anything else you could do, right? Because they float, and hopefully, maybe you might save some lives. That would be nice, but this is exactly what's instructed in Scripture here, is that they would take the rubble, the, the broken pieces that are there, and use them take the planks and the other pieces of the ship and they're going to ride them in to shore. 
You know, a lot of times you realize that in the storms of life, things are rough. Right? Amen? Some storms that we're in are because we won't listen. Just like the crew that wouldn't listen to Paul when he said that, this, that it was dangerous and it was disastrous, the outcome, what was going to happen. They didn't want to hear him. Didn't want to hear him. They had a different agenda, so they were pressing forward. Some sto- storms are because we're holding on to little pieces to keep us af- afloat. And when I, when I think of that, you know, sometimes when we realize in our life the very things that bring us to the place to let go of it all and then be freed in Christ, right? Your ship's all busted up and you're hanging on to a little piece of something, you know? And in this story, that was taking them to safety, but in many times, it's the very thing that takes us to our death. And many times, the things that we try to hang on are the very things that God wants to just float off and get away from us. Sometimes, we forget that the very storm that we are in and the very turbulent waters and all the things that were happening, everything around us brought us to a place that we have the opportunity to let go and let God. Sometimes we can be severely hurt in the storms of life. And we find ourselves in an aftermath of broken pieces and the pain that goes with that. But sometimes those broken pieces pieces help us to escape with our very lives. To escape with our very lives. Sometimes we don't realize it, how much things have a hold of us until you get into a storm. Can you imagine the panic that happens? You know, the routine that you go through Uh, We do drills even in the school here for a tornado or a fire drill or these kinds of things. And the reason we do those, the reason we do those is because we want to make sure that everybody is safe when panic sets in, you see. Because when panic sets in, people do goofy stuff, right? They fall over the top of each other. They clog up doorways. they, They go exactly the wrong places. And there's a loss of life. And on the journey of our lives, you know, we find ourselves so many times, we have the scriptures that we look to and we look for direction and we see answers right before us. We see the Apostle Paul guided along by the Holy Spirit of God on a regular basis. He gives sound advice on a regular basis. He's always focused on accomplishing the very purposes of God. Amen. And as a result, you see the outcome. Even in the most hellish of circumstances, be it locked up, beaten, flogged, finding himself aboard a ship, being taken so he can stand trial, he still keeps focused on a mission that his voice is always communicating the truths of God. And in the storms of our life, we find ourselves so many times challenged because either you can get lost in that storm, you get lost in the storm. You you ever notice, you know, you could go through all these drills that we do in the school, the tornado drill, the fire drill, all those, you go through these drills, and when something's happening, we had a wicked storm come through here, right? Wicked storm. It kicked up like that, and it was right at dismissal of school. So we had all these people that have to follow instruction right now, and they get confused really quickly. I mean, it's one thing to go through the drill. You know, it's everybody's laughing. It's fun. You just, they get on the floor and they do a little thing. But when you got winds that are busting trees and back right on the next street over, busting trees that your, both your arms would have trouble going around, now you got another story. You hear what I'm telling you? Now everything that's going on, it's like Charlie Brown's parents talking. Whoa, 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 whoa. Because now life gets real. Do you hear what I'm telling you? So when we're talking about the storms of life, when you think about finding yourself at a place to have such sound advice that it would affect the lives of everybody around you, do you hear what I'm telling you? He's a prisoner. His voice is the very voice that was the redeeming quality of what happened on that vessel. Do you hear what I'm saying? His head was together. He knew for certain they were lost. And we have an opportunity as 
followers of the Lord Jesus to have a voice that is rock solid, stable in the midst of the storms. Paul said, absent from the body, present with the Lord, right? And he also said he struggled with that because the thought of being heaven bound was exciting, but his work here wasn't done. How many of us take a minute to think about that? That when the game ends here, you're going home. Are we hanging on to here? Or do you got a piece of the broken vessel that you won't let go of that hinders you from accomplishing what God wants to do in the midst of your storm? You hearing me? So we have opportunity. We have opportunity to learn from the scriptures on a regular basis. We can see in the midst of a crazy storm. There's no way to take the, the story that you find in Acts 27. You, you can't take that and look at it and it's just some casual thing. If you put yourself in the midst of those kinds of, of waves and the battering that was going on and everything that was happening with the, those who are on a vessel on a regular basis, this isn't their first rodeo. You hear what I'm telling you? And when they came to a place to say that all hope was lost, it was bad. It was bad. So where are you at? Are you at a place, do you think all hope is lost? Do you feel as if, you know, it's over? And that I just lose sight, so I do what? Move forward faith without faith? Faithless? Or in the midst of every storm, are you looking for the possibility to be the light of Christ in somebody's life? Are you with me? Because that's what Paul was. That's who Paul was. You remember in the story where we heard that he got favor to go to see his companions to see if they would provide his needs? Do you remember? Who's getting that done? Do you understand in the midst of what God wants to do, he's going to do stuff in our lives. But we have to understand there's going to be storms that come in that are going to be hellish. And in fact, listen, we, we like to blame the devil on everything, but I'm just going to tell you something just to clear up. Some, sometimes when we're getting on the ship and we're going to leave port and we look at the circumstances and the Holy Spirit of God says, stay here, you need to stop and yield to him. Amen? But if you're a victim of circumstance, as Paul was, he was being detained, he was brought aboard, he had no choice but to go with him, then God will keep you safe was what the devil means for for evil, God intends for good. He's going to turn them circumstances upside down. He's going to accomplish a purpose in and through your life. But you have to understand, he's not going to take you out of the storm. He's not going to take you out of the storm. I don't know what we got going there. Highlight my points up there, are you? Simmer down now. Act like you've got some sense. Guys, listen. Our lives, our lives are going to have all sorts of these things happen. You're going to find yourself in crazy circumstances. And, and people, Christian people, godly people, yeah, godly people find themselves saying stuff like, wow, when am I going to get a break? Instead of looking at it and saying, God's doing something in and through my life right now. And, and, Everything that's happening is not catching him by surprise. Even these goofy noises coming on in this building right now. Amen? Amen? When I think of it, I just look at it and say, every time there's something going on, I'm always looking, where is God in the midst of opportunity here? Listen, if you think in your life that things are going to be a paved highway for you and it's going to be just wonderful, you're out of your mind. Jesus had the road to Calvary. Amen? Amen? He had us be in the garden in, in distress. All of these things were happening. And the reality of it is that God has his way through our lives when we keep our eyes focused on him. And when you understand what's happening to you isn't supposed to be something that surprises us. It's something that we embrace in the midst of it. And guess what happens? We accomplish the very purposes of God. So at the end of the day, I don't know where you're at, where you find yourself. I don't know if you've ever come to a place that you've called upon the Lord Jesus because when you do that, you know what happens? We find ourselves receiving 
the benefit of the Holy Spirit of God indwelling us, meaning we would be directed by his Holy Spirit. But if we don't, if you not ask Jesus to save you, you're on the outside of it, and all the things of these scriptures seem foolishness to you. So the journey begins with receiving what Jesus did on the cross for the payment of your sin. If you've never done that, you need to do that today. That's where the journey begins. But if you have done that, you find yourself at a place that you're looking at your life and you find these storms and as soon as the storm ki kicks up, you're looking for how to jump overboard, you're looking for a different answer, you're looking for, you know, maybe the multitude of people to give advice to you instead of listening or sticking to what God would say. Wherever you find yourself, it's in the midst of the storms that the world sees Jesus. Amen? You wear that well. There's no doubt that calmness in the storm makes a huge difference, folks. Wherever you find yourself tonight, whether it's at a place where you're in a storm and you're just looking to be strengthened, why don't you talk to the Lord about it before you leave this place? Maybe you say, you know what, I've been a disgrace. I'm just like those clowns that were lowing the lifeboat over and they're pretending like they're dropping anchor and they're going to escape. I'm going to leave these guys back here to die. And God says, no, I want you to be a light that redeems them. I want you to introduce them to me. Stay aboard and trust me. In the midst of your storm, wherever you find yourself in this time of invitation, respond. Why don't you stand? Everybody, why don't you stand if you can? Stand if you can't. Go ahead and stay seated. I'm going to pray. and I'm going to ask the Lord to move in this place right now. Father God, I thank you for all who are here tonight. I thank you for the opportunities that you give us. I thank you for the storms of life, God. That's a crazy thing. Because we know in the storm, sometimes you have to bust stuff up in order that we come to a place that we would be very grateful to escape with our very lives. Thank you, Jesus, for making it possible. Thank you for the cross that you paid the penalty of our sin. And thank you, God, that you give us peace in the midst of the storm. Now, God, for all that would be struggling here tonight, I pray that you would draw them to yourself, that they would take the step that's required for them to weather the storm. In this time of invitation, Father God, I just pray that you would bless it. In Jesus' name, as the music plays, would you come? the sure and steady anchor while the tempest rages on when temptation claims the battle and it seems the night has won deeper still then goes the anchor though I justly stand accused I will sure and steady anchor through the floods of unbelief hopeless somehow oh my 
Father God, we thank you for this time together. God, would you help us in the storms that we travel through to trust in you. God, if this trust is an issue in our heart, God, I pray that you would rise up in us a desire to call upon you to build that trust in order to, in the most hellish of storms, that we would proclaim the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he's made all this possible. And as we go from this place, God, keep us safe. Help us to trust in you so the world would see your son. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.